In this video, we're going to talk about some of the nice properties of Parafac. The most important one being the uniqueness. And we want to discuss when we can expect to have unique solutions. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about how Parafac can handle noise and missing data. So, what can we do with uniqueness? Well, uniqueness is the fact that we only have one solution in Parafac. And because we only have one solution, then if the data behaves, for example, according to Beer's law, we can estimate pure underlying components, like pure spectra, even in mixtures. So that means we can separate mixtures of analytes, which is exactly the same as chromatography. And as in chromatography, we can therefore estimate concentrations, and we can find pure spectra and underlying profiles. And this is helpful because it helps us remove, for example, indirect correlations because now we separate the different chemical analytes. So we separate the contributions from different chemical analytes. And somehow this also eliminates outliers. And it does so in the sense that if I have a new sample that contains a new chemical, so for example, if I build my model on blue and green analytes, and now I get a new sample that has the red analyte, well, I can just fit a Parafac model with free components, and that way I have handled this new component. So it's not really an outlier anymore, because Parafac will estimate the blue and the green one independently of the red one, as long as I use an extra component. So in that particular sense, we don't have outliers anymore. The models we get from Parafac are much more chemical, you can say, than what we get from, for example, PCA. And that makes it simpler to communicate and to communicate, for example, with chemists about the model and for chemists to interact with your model building. And because of the structure of the freeway model, which we will get back to, it's also much more noise insensitive than an unfold model, for example. But there are conditions for when we can have uniqueness. Imagine that I have a matrix. If I have a matrix, I can build, for example, a PCA model, scores times loadings. And that model would have a kind of rotational freedom. I would be able to rotate my scores and my loadings and still have the same fit to the data. So I don't have the uniqueness that we have in Parafac. Now imagine that I just take this matrix and replicate it many times. So now I get a freeway array with identical frontal slabs like here. If I build a Parafac model on this, it's not going to be unique. If it was, then actually PCA would be unique. So naturally there are some conditions for when we can expect a uniqueness of a model. And essentially, you can say that what we need to have uniqueness is that A, B, and C have adequate variation. In the situation with the replicate, the C would just be all the same numbers. Just a, You could just plug in a number of ones. There wouldn't be any new information. And in fact, the rank of C would be 1 because it was all replicates. They all had the same variation and the same information. So conceptually, we just need A, B, and C to be high rank. If they have full rank, then in general, the model will be unique. There are more formal conditions for uniqueness, and I'm going to explain those. Uh, but they are a little bit difficult to work with. They are based on what is called K rank. The K rank is defined here. It's the maximum number of columns that you can take out that will have a uh, full rank even uh, when randomly chosen. So imagine I have a matrix here which has all different columns. No matter what columns I take out, those will be independent. Imagine now that column 1 and column 2 are identical. If I take out two columns here, then sometimes I will take out column 1 and 2 and because they are identical, the rank is 1. 
So the K rank is not going to be uh, two, it's going to be one because it can maximum take one column out and be sure that it will be uh, full rank. So K rank, K rank is a little bit strange, uh, but it's somehow related to rank. It's never going to be higher than the rank, and for most kinds of data, it's going to be the same as the rank. But there might be situations where the K rank is less than the rank. Conceptually, right now, we can sort of think of it as a uh, rank. Now, having the K rank, the rule for uniqueness can be stated as the K rank of component A plus component B plus component C. If that sum is larger than two times the number of components plus two, the model will be unique. This condition is not a necessary condition, so there could be other situations where we also have uniqueness, but it is a sufficient condition, so it means that this is, if this is fulfilled, the model will be unique. So what does it actually imply? Well, here's an example. If we have a 6 by 6 by 6 array, then an 8 component model can be unique. So an 8 component parafact model of a 6 by 6 by 6 array can be unique. So that means that we can have six samples only, and we can still find eight components. And not only can we find eight components, but we can find them uniquely. So for example, we could estimate the concentrations of eight different chemicals from just six samples. This is clearly different from what we do in two-way analysis and what we can do in two-way analysis. And it shows you some of the advantages of using a parafact. Of course, we would like to have more than just six samples or six variables in each mode, but it just shows you uh, that, that we, we gain information by keeping the data as a freeway array. If I unfold this freeway array to a 6 by 36 matrix, I can only extract six components, but by keeping it as a freeway array, I can extract um, eight components uniquely. Okay, let's take a look at two other aspects of uh, parafact modeling. Uh, the noise properties and how we can handle missing data. Here's just an example data array. Let's say we have a freeway array which is 10 by 100 by 30. If I unfold the data in the first mode, I would have a 10 by 3000 matrix. Now, if I build let's say, a parafact model of the freeway array, that, that uh, well, one component from such a model would have 10 plus 100 plus 30 parameters, the loadings in each mode. If I build a PCA model or something like that, then each component would have 10 score values and 3,000 uh, variables, uh, loadings in the variable mode. So clearly, there's a lot more component um, parameters in the PCA components than there would be in the Parafact components. Now imagine that Parafact is adequate. So Parafact can model the data, let's say that the data is rank free, well then Parafact can model with free components. PCA can also model the data with free components in that case, but it's going to use many, many more parameters. And because it does that, it's going to be overfitting much more than the Parafact model is. So if Parafact is a valid model, then it's going to be much more robust than an unfold model. The unfold model can also do the job, but it's going to be affected much more by noise. Here's an example, not very intuitive, but this is just a script that will uh, generate an example of how we can handle uh, missing data. What it's going to do is that it's going to add 0, 50, and 500 times some random numbers to a data set. I'm not going to explain the actual script here, but it's just here for your convenience in case you want to try out uh, in MATLAB. And add 500% uh, of noise. And in this case, you see that we can hardly see the data here, but even though there's mainly noise here, the Parafact model is still able to actually capture the data. Naturally, 
The loadings now become quite noisy, but overall they are very similar to what we get even in the noise-free case. And that is sort of an indication of how well the Parafact model handles noise or how robust the Parafact model is because it uses very few parameters compared to an unfold model. The last part I want to discuss here is how we can handle missing data. And in order to explain that, we can first start by looking at how we handle missing data or can handle missing data in a two-way model. This is PCA, or actually this is the loss function that we try to minimize in PCA, x minus the model, so that would be the residuals. Now the sum of squares of that is that is what we try to minimize uh, when we fit a PCA model. We can write this in a scalar notation like this. So for every row and every column, we model the data as the, the scores times the loadings for that particular sample and variable over all components. And the sum of squares of the residuals would just be this residual for every element squared. This is the loss function we normally have. Imagine that some elements are missing in X, so some particular combinations of X, I, J are absent. Well, what we can do then is just add a simple weight, and this weight is 1 normally, but if the element is missing, then this element is going to be 0. So what that means is that I'm going to fit my model in a least square sense, but only to the data that I actually have. Conceptually, that makes sense. We try to fit the data to the elements we have. So we try to do what we do when we don't have missing data, but only for the information we know of. So here you can see that for these elements in X that where we might miss some information, we simply add a weight of zero, and that way we don't estimate or try to fit something that we don't know uh, anything of. This is a very nice uh, approach for handling missing data. How can we actually estimate this? Well, there are basically two approaches at least. One is that we can use weighted least squares regression. So if we have a weighted least squares regression, then instead of doing alternating least squares, we can do alternating weighted least squares regression. Or we can use imputation, and I'm going to explain that in detail. Now the thing is, these two methods will give the same results in the end. This method is easy to implement because you just need a least squares algorithm. The other method up here, the weighted least squares, is sometimes a little bit more efficient in terms of the number of iterations, but it also requires more memory. Uh, so that's why we chose to implement method 2 in most of our algorithms. And the way we do imputation is that we start out by just plugging in numbers where we have missing elements. We can use suitable numbers or even just random numbers, but we, we just plug in some numbers. And when we do that, we don't have missing elements anymore. And when we don't have missing elements, we can fit a model to the data set. We can use our normal algorithm because we don't have any missing data anymore. So, for example, if we were doing PCA, we could fit a PCA model, scores times loadings, to a data set. Now, the data set is wrong because we plugged in some stupid numbers, but we still get a model. And what we can do is that we can replace these elements up here with the estimates from the model. And that means they're going to be a little bit more smart than the ones we used initially. So now we can fit a new model and get a new estimate, and we plug those in. And we keep doing this, iterating through uh, estimating the model and replacing the missing data. And in the end, the elements that we plug in are going to be having a zero residual, so they're not going to change anything anymore. And that means they have a weight of zero, and that means we have fitted the model to the other part of the data. So this imputation method is just a very convenient way of handling missing data because we use a normal algorithm. And we can do the same for Parafact that I have shown here for PCA randomly assign 
a missing value, which is NAN in MATLAB, not a number, to 30,000 of the approximately 60,000 elements uh, in our uh, amino acid data. So about 50% of the data is going to be missing, and then we can try and fit a Parafact model to that. Here's the data with 50% missing. All five samples are shown, and you can see that there's quite a lot of missing uh, data points. Visually, it, it appears worse than it actually is, but 50% but of the data is absent now. But we can still fit a Parafact model uh, to the data set and would get uh, loadings as shown here. And you can hardly see the difference uh, from the unconstrained model. In fact, this model is going to fit better, uh, at least in terms of percentage variance explained, because mathematically this is a simpler problem. I only have to fit 30,000 uh, elements instead of 60,000 uh, when I have no missing data. But essentially, it's going to be more or less exactly the same model as on the whole data set.